in the subject of string amplitudes, and I was uh, told to give some balanced overview of how different formalisms have fed into these recent developments. Most notably, I'll be speaking of the Ramon de Schwartz and uh, Pure Spinner formalism. And before even uh, starting to talk about string amplitudes, uh, I guess we should make sure that we are all motivated about this. So let me uh, share some of my personal motivations uh, for this with you. Uh, there could be, roughly speaking, three blocks of reasons why one might be excited about scattering amplitudes and string theories. First of all, uh, the string amplitudes are a subject that nicely intertwine with modern questions in field theory, where field theory collectively refers to both gauge theory and gravity. So uh, you might have come across this mantra that gravity at the perturbative level is in some sense the square of a gauge theory. Of course, this slogan deserves a lot of uh, quotation marks. It refers to recent results of Bernd Carrasco Johansson and collaborators that you can organize scattering amplitudes in perturbative gravity in terms of suitable bilinears of gauge theory quantities, which is pretty useful to go to higher loop order in uh, supergravity calculations. And this, in turn, revealed numerous surprises about the ultraviolet behavior. And also from a conceptual point of view, I believe it's pretty appealing if a more complicated theory can be reduced to slightly simpler building blocks. So this is something where string theory gives you a quite natural starting point. Gravity, roughly speaking, comes from closed strings. Gauge theories, roughly speaking, come from open strings. And it's quite geometrically intuitive that by joining the endpoints of two open strings, you can form a closed string. So this is geometrically quite natural in string theory. And indeed, you can arrive at a variety of double copy representations of gravitational amplitudes by first doing a closed string calculation, exploit uh, chiral splitting into open string building blocks, and to then take the field theory limit. So this is already setting up some uh, notation and terminology that is relevant throughout these lectures. Alpha prime is taken uh, to be the uh, Reggie slope, and you can view it as the square of some fundamental length parameter in string theory. So alpha prime has uh, units of square meters, and even though I shouldn't send a dimension for quantity to zero, I'll loosely speak of alpha prime to zero as taking the point particle limit. So if you want to extract uh, field theory wisdom, gauge theory gravity, then you should evaluate a string amplitude as a function of alpha prime and send the letter to zero. Okay, so all of these tricks uh, form the first pillar of motivation for these lectures. Let me come to the second one. If you want to convince a string theorist that it's valuable to compute scattering amplitudes, then one starting point to do this marketing is to um, advertise amplitudes as a laboratory for string dualities. So more precisely, if uh, you have a string amplitude in your hand and you expand it, in alpha prime, if you expand it around low energies, then you have a window into the low energy effective action of that string theory. Or at least you have a perturbative window into that. But uh, as you know uh, very well, there are a lot of dualities between different string theories. Think, for instance, of S-duality of the type 2B theory or heterotic type 1. And all of these dualities have a manifestation at the level of scattering amplitudes. So you can use amplitudes, first of all, to test dualities, and secondly, to squeeze the best out of the duality to learn new things. And as absurd as this may sound, amplitudes, by means of string dualities, even give you a window into the non-perturbative. Because in many instances, it's particularly a manifest in the S-duality of type, of type 2b, you can use the duality to convert perturbative input, as you get it from amplitudes, uh, to connect it with non-perturbative data, such as instanton effects, which arise as the, um, the Fourier expansion of certain uh, automorphic forms in the type 2b effective action. So string amplitudes going all the way to the non-perturbative if you're good at uh, string dualities. And let me finally give a third piece of motivation why uh, string amplitudes are fun to study. It's bringing us on one table together with mathematicians. Uh, among other things, uh, 
String amplitudes are a beautiful laboratory for multiple zeta values, certain uh, nested sums. I guess you all came across the Riemann zeta value a zillion times. There is some uh, smooth generalization of the, multiple, of the Riemann zeta function to cover multiple arguments, multiple zeta values, and these in turn are a, a topic of active investigation at the intersection of number theory and algebraic geometry. So you can use string tree-level amplitudes to uh, see multiple zeta values in action. And if you go um, a little bit beyond that, you can, um, at more general orders in perturbation theory, get a window into polylogarithms, modular forms, and all of those at various genera. So again, the idea is to perform a low-energy expansion around alpha prime equals zero of string amplitudes, and as the coefficients of this low energy expansion, you tend to find these uh, interesting uh, objects, zeta values, polylogarithms, and elliptic generalizations. Okay, in summary, there are at least uh, three directions of motivation why it's interesting to study string amplitudes. Okay, so this concludes part 1.1, uh, the motivation. And uh, let me now get uh, increasingly specific. Let me now start with an intuitive picture. of string perturbation theory. Let me be more precise to which kind of objects all these uh, buzzwords related to this blackboard here apply. So the idea in string perturbation theory is to do a topological expansion. or amplitudes involving both open and closed strings. Okay, so if you complete uh, this sentence here with open strings, then you would start by uh, drawing diagrams of the following type. Suppose you think of a four-point scattering process with four open string states coming from the infinite past and going to the infinite future. If you build on the same kind of intuition that is underlying Feynman diagrams, you would be drawing a cartoon like this. And uh, here, this uh, two-dimensional surface swept out by the open strings doesn't exhibit any holes. And uh, therefore, this is just the tree-level approximation to that um, four-point open string scattering process. And if you want to get increasingly precise about the dependence on the string coupling, we are supposed to redraw that diagram, but now allow for different numbers of holes inside that uh, world sheet. And uh, for closed strings, you would draw similar diagrams but here it's about world sheets without boundary, or putting it differently, this time it's a closed string whose uh, propagation in space-time we are tracking. So we should be drawing a diagram involving long cylindrical tubes for the incoming and outgoing closed string states. But many of the statements from the open string case are unchanged. If I want to be increasingly precise, for the order in the string coupling, I should redraw that diagram with an increasing number of holes to go from tree level to one loop, and I guess it's pretty obvious what higher loops uh, have to offer. Okay, so um, let me now uh, give a concrete uh, backup for the claims related to field theory. Um, this organization in terms of uh, diagrams with different loop numbers is pretty uh, well known from field theory. So if I were to write down or draw the analogous expansion in field theory amplitudes, um, I would be drawing Feynman diagrams. 
associated with a certain four-point scattering process. And um, in contrast to field theory, there is a length parameter involved in open and closed string scattering amplitudes, namely alpha prime. And as I was already uh, writing here, if you know the string amplitude as a function of alpha prime, and if you furthermore manage to take the alpha prime to zero limit, then you should recover field theory amplitudes. And uh, this statement applies to both uh, open and closed strings in both cases. If you're good uh, with the functional form of the amplitude uh, on alpha prime, then you will be able to evaluate uh, this limit and to recover Feynman diagrams. And here you see um, one funny effect. At the string theory level, there's a single diagram for the tree-level interaction, for the tree-level amplitude. But in Feynman diagrams, there's the S-channel, T-channel, and U-channel. And furthermore, uh, there are quartic vertices for the field theories of interest. So this is a first way of seeing string theory is very efficient. There are far less world sheet diagrams in comparison to Feynman diagrams. Suppose you repeat this in an endpoint processing gravity. There are two n minus five double factorial diagrams, Feynman diagrams, quite a lot, but there's a single world sheet for that gravitational process, which spits out all of these Feynman diagrams if you send alpha prime to zero. More precisely, they're coming from different corners of moduli space. We will look at examples of this later on. All right, so that business with the field theory limit, uh, I just told the story at the tree level, but uh, I can say more or less uh, the same things about the one loop level. So this time, if you have good control of the dependence of these diagrams on alpha prime, you should be able to recover a box integral. Okay, if you're good with supersymmetric field theories, then you will know that in case of maximal SUSY, the box diagram is uh, all you can get for, for gluons and for gravitons with maximal supersymmetry. But if you look at less supersymmetric theories, there can also be triangle contributions. And uh, both boxes and tentatively triangles in case of reduced supersymmetry, you can get from the alpha prime to zero limit of the corresponding string theory calculations. Okay, I was sneaking around uh, naming the field theories. So when coming from the open string side, I have a gauge theory in mind. Um, most naively, this is 10 dimensional super young mills, but if you play around with a number of space time dimensions in your string theory with the amount of supersymmetry, then you can also arrive at some version of n equal two super young mills or n equal one super young mills. And here on the closed string side, the, the field theory I have in mind is uh, supergravity. And again, you can play around with the amount and extent of uh, supersymmetry. Yeah, so you see, uh, the same set of diagrams can be approached from two directions, either from the open or from the closed string direction. And therefore, it's not so surprising that if you look at the coefficient of the box integral in gauge theory and supergravity, that you will find pretty similar coefficients along with the box diagram. So this is a, a more concrete version of saying gravity equals uh, gauge theory square. If you work out the coefficient of the box integral in the closed string case, you will find the square of the accompanying kinematic factor as if you're, you were doing this with the open string. So by pulling out concrete Feynman diagrams from both open and closed strings, you can compare what the associated uh, coefficients are, what the associated kinematic factors are. This is how you can feel in some instances how gravity behaves like a, a square of, of gauge theories. All right, um, so let me say a bit more about the world sheets. Um, of course, having these infinitely long uh, tubes is good for the intuition that they are states coming from past infinity and scattering off to uh, infinite future. But uh, for practical calculations, this might not be the optimal presentation. So, yes, please. Right, uh, the counter term for 
uh, for instance, the UV divergence of the box integral can be obtained from the low energy limit of that supergravity amplitude. How does this buzzword low energy relate to alpha prime to zero? So strictly speaking, these stringy loop amplitudes, they depend on both alpha prime and log alpha prime, or I should say, depend on the kinematic invariance and also on their logs. And you need to look at the logarithmic part, at the discontinuous part of a string amplitude in order to uh, recover the Feynman diagrams. But at the same time, you can look at the power behaved terms in alpha prime, like the analytic momentum dependence. And the leading terms in the analytic momentum dependences here, they give you the counter terms. So concretely, there's an R to the fourth uh, counter term that uh, takes the role of the, yeah, that plays out with the box graph in eight dimensions and higher. Okay, where was I? Yes, uh, I was about to complain that these very long uh, tubes are not optimal for practical calculations. So the uh, picture we are really studying is something topologically equivalent to that, where the infinitely long uh, tubes are replaced by point-like defects or just punctures. Yeah, so if you just imagine these infinitely long tubes are punctures, then you uh, can view this as a disk diagram. So open string tree level is about studying punctured disks. And analogously, open string at the one loop level gives you a cylinder and a Möbius strip. Let me just uh, draw the cylinder. So here, the punctured surface you should be studying is depicted here. And to be slightly more complete, for the cylinder topology, you can have a situation where open string insertions appear on both boundaries. I mean, just imagine this diagram where the inner boundary might have an asymptotic state insertion. So this would be what we sometimes call a non-planar cylinder. This would be a situation where punctures appear on both boundaries of the cylinder. Okay, and the uh, topologies on the closed string side include the sphere with some punctures, and here at the one loop level, the torus with some punctures. Four punctures if we stick to the four point amplitude. Okay, uh, let me say a little bit more um, details about the business with the, with the punctures. What we need to do in order to arrive at the mathematical expression for these diagrams, we need to integrate over all conformally inequivalent ways of drawing these diagrams. So we need to integrate over so-called moduli spaces. often denoted by MGN. So this is the moduli space of N punctured uh, genus G surfaces. Okay, so the first uh, index G refers to the loop order. The second number after the semicolon n refers to the number of uh, punctures. <clears throat> and uh, one of the key challenges in evaluating string amplitudes is to be good at evaluating these uh, moduli space integrals. I'll shortly have some disclaimers of how this relates to super moduli spaces. <coughs> and then uh, the story with the open string uh, punctures deserves uh, some elaboration. Though it's uh, some sort of obvious from uh, the examples here, let me stress the open string punctures are always inserted at uh, boundaries of the surface. And um, 
At the boundary, you have a notion of cyclic ordering. If I have four punctures on a disk boundary, um, there's a notion of being neighbor. There's a difference whether I order them as one, two, three, four, or maybe one, three, two, four. So this notion of ordering is not uh, invariant under exchanging um, two of the punctures. So whenever there are boundaries involved, and sometimes there are many as you see, then for each boundary there is a cyclic ordering. Let me redraw the situation from the disk and allow for more particles. And for each such boundary, you can immediately say what kind of uh, color dependence the open string amplitude will have. Okay, I'm using the buzzword color for the first time now, so let me explain. So for each open string state, there are some internal degrees of freedom associated with the endpoints of the underlying uh, open string. So each external string state will always have some uh, adjoint index. for the internal or color degrees of freedom of uh, the given state. So here, if it's A1, it refers to the first external state. Yeah, so this is admittedly some kind of jargon. I will often talk about these uh, internal degrees of freedom as being color even though I'm not necessarily thinking of QCD. It's just jargon, okay? <laughs> and I uh, think the more official word is uh, Chan Payton factors. But uh, okay, now let me come to the uh, message I actually wanted to deliver. So once you have committed to a given cyclic ordering on a world sheet boundary, then the dependence on the, these color degrees of freedom is carried by a trace whose cyclic ordering matches the, the one how your punctures are located at the boundary. So if my boundary ordering is 1, to 3, dot, 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 all the way to n, I should better put these uh, un generators in the same cyclic order inside the trace. And there's one such trace factor for each boundary. So at the one loop level here, this is a double trace. Yeah, so I wanted to say this at an early stage because now I no longer have to track this color dependence. So now I can restrict the discussion for open string amplitudes to the coefficient of these traces. <clears throat> Okay, so now at least we got to some uh, pictures, we got to some buzzwords such as moduli spaces and Chan Payton factors. Let me get uh, a bit more precise. Let me share my personal uh, view on how to disentangle different challenges in string amplitudes. Let me propose an organization of the work according to integrands and integrals. <clears throat> so how to organize the calculation of uh, string amplitudes. Let's say you have already decided for which diagram you're about to evaluate. Suppose your target is at a specific loop order, G loop, and as a, at a specific multiplicity, N points. So sure, you will at some point evaluate an integral over that uh, moduli space, MGN. But uh, what exactly do you integrate? So let me give the let me give a cartoon of 
how typical string integrands look like and make the cartoon sufficiently sketchy such that it applies to different formalisms. <clears throat> So you must tell the integrand about the uh, scattering data. I haven't even told you about what string amplitudes depend on. So for sure, you must feed in the degrees of freedom of your external states. And this is done using vertex operators. I will spell out these vertex operators in the RNS and in the pure spinner formalism. Um, and just to enumerate uh, the kind of animals that you find inside, they contain the scattering data, such as polarizations. If you scatter spin one particles, there's a polarization vector. If you scatter fermions, there are polarization spinners. And of course, there will be momenta. I'll always use the letter K when I refer to momenta. And if it's the ith state, then there will be a subscript Ki. <clears throat> yeah, so these are the uh, scattering data elements inside a vertex operator. But also, these vertex operators depend on uh, world sheet fields. So this is a part that is... Uh, a bit more specific to the formalism. Just to do some name drop, dropping, or, dropping already here, you will find, for instance, the world sheet fields of the RNS formalism or those of the pure spinner formalism. And uh, even though I often alluded to field theory, I didn't say it explicitly. In these lectures, I'll only have the scattering of massless states in mind. Of course, this general formalism here also allows you to scatter massive states, some Regge excitations, but most of the things I'll be telling you this lecture is uh, about mass kernel states. the notion of low energy expansion becomes uh, problematic to define if we <laughs> start scattering massive states. Okay, so this is uh, already specifying uh, quite a bit of the typical integrand inside a string amplitude. Um, these arguments, Z1 all the way to Zn, these are the punctures in some suitable parametrization of the moduli space. But uh, this is usually not the full story of what you have to uh, massage in a perturbative uh, string uh, calculation. On top of the vertex operators, there might be some more stuff in your amplitude prescription. And to be sufficiently general, let me say the extras are either picture-changing operators and or certain ghost contributions. You will see examples later on. And in particular at loop level, it uh, usually happens that the insertions of these uh, picture changes or ghosts are uh, different from the insertion points of the vertex operators. And then it's often a separate challenge to to show in explicit calculations that the position where you put them doesn't really matter. Okay, there are usually general arguments that uh, these punctures must drop out, but in explicit calculations it's sometimes uh, quite a challenge to <laughs> see that happening. Yeah, so um, I was implicitly uh, using a lot of uh, properties of this angular bracket around there. What this does this angular bracket stand for? This stands for evaluate a CFT correlation function on the surface of the right uh, genus. 
And uh, yeah, the CFT correlator, this uh, actually forms the backbone of what is called the integrand. So the headline is uh, how to compute string amplitudes. And uh, the first step is to work out the integrand. Determine, or in the best case scenario, simplify. The integrand. So this is uh, a conformal field theory challenge. Evaluate the CFT correlator, which is tailored to the genus under investigation, and which will introduce a dependence on the moduli of that surface. So for one-loop scattering of closed strings, you do the correlator on a torus, and accordingly there will be a dependence on a complex number tau that describes the shape of that torus. Okay, and uh, as you saw, there's a lot of stuff entering that uh, correlation function, a lot of world sheet fields from the vertex operators, and uh, also some more decoration from the picture-changing operators or the ghosts. And uh, I will exemplify some of the simplest correlators in two formalisms, namely the RNS, Ramon over Schwartz formalism, where you have supersymmetry on the world sheet. And also the pure spinner formalism, where you have manifest uh, supersymmetry in space time. <clears throat> and uh, Depending on which formalism uh, you use, um, both have their individual advantages and drawbacks. Some parts of the CFT calculation are easier in RNS, others are easier in pure spinner. I hope I'll uh, be able to provide uh, illuminating examples for both. All right, so this uh, refers to the um, integrand part of the story, get control on your genus G correlation function. And again, I not only have A evaluation in mind, but in the best case scenario, also a simplification, such that you have an easier time proceeding to step number B. If there are integrands around, there are usually also some integrals around. I guess that's the purpose in life of integrands. <laughs> The next step, once you are done in the CFT sector, you're supposed to perform the integrals over the respective uh, moduli space. And um, you see my violent attempt to be formalism agnostic in the schematic formula above. And I don't think I'll manage to stay uh, formalism agnostic forever. Let me make the bis big disclaimer here that this formula should only be taken serious at low loop order. Only if we are at sufficiently low loop order, only then you can restrict your attention to the moduli space of ordinary Riemann surfaces. I guess uh, at sufficiently high loop order, you will really need to talk about super um, moduli spaces, about super Riemann surfaces, and at some point in perturbation theory, you can no longer disentangle the fermionic moduli and the bosonic moduli. I mean, for sure, super moduli do exist at tree level and the one loop order of RNS, but there it's quite well understood how to integrate over the fermions first and to later on do a bosonic moduli space integral. So this formula pretends that we are in this fortunate situation where the fermionic moduli are integrated out and where there's only a bosonic integral left to do. 
But this fortunate situation, uh, it seems like one cannot attain this uh, at the earliest at the five loop order. Is that correct, uh, Ron? So I guess all of these sentences, uh, you would get a much more accurate account if uh, Ron was to tell you these things. <laughs> so in general, you won't be able to split the supermoduli space underlying RNS. So when I claim you need to integrate over bosonic moduli spaces, then I'm probably assuming that you are below five loops. Ah, okay, so for the four-point function, this might be at the three-loop, four-loop order, something like that? Okay. <laughs> Um, in the pure spinner formalism, in turn, there are no fermionic moduli. And there is a three-loop calculation that I hopefully have the time to tell you about. A three-loop calculation in the pure spinner formalism done by Humberto Gomez and Carlos Mafra. And uh, at least for the purpose of getting the low energy uh, limit of that, they managed to get a handle on the um, CFT correlator and um, the bosonic integral over something like M34. Oh, yes, Ted. Okay, so your question concerns what's the extra difficulty when it's about supermoduli as compared to the bosonic moduli? Right, right. Oh. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, I probably didn't get to the point yet to specify what I mean by doing the integral. So what I have in mind is you uh, probably want to be able to find a primitive for each integration variable. So you want to organize your amplitude in a system of function or functions where you're always able to take a primitive. At tree level, this is about polylogarithms. And to a large extent, the ability to find a primitive is uh, flowing out of the number theory and uh, algebraic geometry literature. And I guess there is a smaller body of algebraic geometry literature when it's about uh, fermionic uh, functions, whose primitives we are longing for. So what I have in mind, I'll spell it out uh, on the, the next things I'll write. Um, I have in mind to really produce a number order by order in alpha prime to really find a result for the integral. And I guess this task does get uh, easier when the bosonic variables are entangled with the fermionic ones. So that's my personal take on that. Okay, so... If we are in the comfort zone where RNS allows you to integrate out the fermions first, then the kind of integrals to do are universal to RNS and uh, uh, pure spinner formalism. So the idea I want to convey is here, and the choice of formalism matters much more in step A when it comes to evaluating the CFT correlator. And uh, in the best case scenario, to the extent that the formalisms are really equivalent loop order by loop order, in the best case scenario, you can check that both of them lead you to the same kind of bosonic integrals that you need to evaluate as step B. So for instance, two loop four points in the parity even sector, there's perfect agreement between the results of Doka and Fong in the RNS and the results of uh, Berkowitz and Mafra and the pure spinner formalism. So the implication of that is in such situations, then the job of doing the integral, it radiates uh, knowledge into both the pure spinner and the RNS front. 
or putting it differently, you are not committing to a formalism when doing moduli space integrals. Uh, but another disclaimer to be made, of course, the functional dependence on uh, alpha prime and uh, momenta is pretty tough in general. Like at the loop order, you'll have uh, discontinuities in the Mandelstam variables, both alpha prime and log alpha prime. And uh, it's much easier to do a low energy expansion focusing on the analytic momentum dependence which is the one that encodes the low energy effect of action. So, um, in tree level cases, but also for certain subsectors of loop amplitudes, I'll be studying Taylor series in alpha prime. At the one loop level, for instance, you do get an honest Taylor series if you stick to a fixed surface. On the torus of a given modular parameter tau, you can integrate out the punctures and obtain a Taylor series. And this is a kind of exercise which allows you to infer low energy effective action operators. Yeah, so those uh, kind of analytic dependencies on alpha prime and the uh, kinematic variables. Yes? Oh yeah, right, right. Uh, in the low energy effective field theory language, this is a derivative expansion, yeah. What here is an expansion in alpha prime or dimensionless combinations with momenta. And uh, the way how I would uh, advertise this exercise is under this Taylor expansion in alpha prime, string amplitudes serve as generating series. for periods of uh, the respective moduli spaces. So these are subjects that are quite uh, actively discussed in the number theory and algebraic geometry literature. You will find many math papers with uh, these guys in the title. And string amplitudes give you a very useful generating series for not necessarily all, but at least uh, many of the uh, relevant periods. And this is uh, the place where I was uh, claiming before. This is the place where it's very beneficial for physicists if we can describe the problem in a manner that it's uh, accessible to mathematicians. There is a tremendous help that we can receive. Uh, in order to do our integrals. For instance, some help of identifying a good system of functions such as polylogs that um, enable us to do, take primitives for anything we might find in the integrand. <clears throat> okay, I understand uh, up to this point the uh, discussion is pretty abstract and uh, to make things more tractable, let me now switch gears and give you a hopefully inviting example for all of the buzzwords that came up so far. And uh, let's be pretty modest for the beginning. Let's do five point tree level for open strings, open uh, superstrings. According to the earlier disclaimer, it's necessarily the massless states that I'm uh, scattering. So it's four gauge bosons, but I'll phrase the result in a manner that you can also apply it to gluinos. Okay, to mention the story with uh, color once more, uh, what I'll actually be discussing is a color stripped amplitude following the general tree level color decomposition. The full tree level amplitude, endpoint open strings, is a linear combination of different uh, traces. And uh, for n external states, there are n minus 1 factorial 
different orderings inside the trace. Don't forget, the trace is cyclic, so it's sufficient if we permute the second all the way up to the last um, member. So we are looking at permutations rho of n minus 1 legs. And then the coefficient of that trace is uh, referred to as a color ordered amplitude or sometimes a sub amplitude. And this one will depend on a cyclic ordering. So I will be discussing uh, the color ordered amplitude at the four point level. So the Welch diagram again is a punctured disk and let us look at the cyclic ordering one, two, three, four, since it's sufficient to compute one of them and to infer the others by relabeling. Okay, um, so I was saying it's for convenience that we prefer to have punctures for the external states rather than infinitely long tubes. And to make things even more convenient, let us use a parametrization of the disk boundary, which is essentially the real axis. Okay, so let's uh, start with some uh, complex variables where the punctures will be located at the real axis. And uh, if you look at the details of the four-point correlation function here, you will find that it depends on fewer variables than four. More precisely, by conformal symmetry, there's only one independent integration variable, namely it's only one cross ratio that you need to integrate over. So at an early stage of the calculation, you should better mod out by SL2, and you can fix any three punctures. Two, zero, one, and infinity. Okay, we have four punctures. Three of them go to zero, one, infinity. There's only one left to integrate. But which one uh, should I integrate and which ones do, uh, should I fix? It actually doesn't matter. <laughs> so for instance, let's take Z1, Z3, Z4. I could have taken any other three. The reason why I personally enjoy to make this choice is with this kind of SL2 fixing, then the leftover integral happens between zero and one. It's more in my personal comfort zone to integrate in a finite range between zero and one, rather than, for instance, the negative half line all the way to minus infinity. But okay, this is just a convenience thing, and there are always changes of variables to also map the others to the unit interval. Whoops. Okay, I guess the point at infinity is rather difficult to draw here, but I think our main uh, attention should be uh, put on the integral over Z2 that you can't uh, fix using uh, conformal symmetry. Okay, I'm wiping out that story about uh, integrands and integrals. Let us assume that in this four-point context, we have uh, finished our job on the integrand level. <coughs> After some work on the integrand, you will find that Among the many variables this amplitude depends on, you can squeeze many of them into a field theory building block. So the color decomposition that I just wrote down for string amplitudes, it of course applies to gauge theory amplitudes in the same way. Whenever your external states are matrix valued or Lie algebra valued, you can do this trace decomposition. So in particular, it holds in super young mills. And the good news is here for the four point open string amplitude, all the dependence on the polarizations can be encoded in this uh, field theory package. So 
So everything else, everything where the string theory physics might sit in, will only depend on momenta. I guess that's tremendous progress, only uh, the momenta to worry about. And um, let me now write down the precise uh, integral that encodes the momentum dependence. So I'm working in the SR2 frame depicted here, where Z2 is integrated from 0 to 1. And uh, here is one um, evergreen part of a correlation function. That's the so-called Coba-Nielsen factor. I'll introduce it properly later on. But uh, all of these uh, tree-level um, correlation functions will have uh, contributions where the punctures are raised to some power, S12, are raised to the power of Mandelstam invariance. And uh, just to be clear about the conventions, since you see the Mandelstam in an exponent, it should better be dimensionless. So the convention is to absorb a power of alpha prime into the definition of Sij. And to work with those. Okay, so uh, the integrand is essentially this polarization package, which is pulled off, off and then there are um, these Coba Nielsen type uh, dependencies on Z2 that are waiting to be integrated. Um, ask me in three minutes, please. We can reverse engineer that together. So what I will now do, I will focus on uh, that part where the integration needs to be done. Let's give this guy a nickname, uh, Z4 point. And I will show different uh, pieces of physics that are encoded in different treatments of that integral, which will, among other things, uh, reveal my choice of metric. Okay, so I will take two different uh, viewpoints on this uh, integral. Oh yeah, just to be clear, it's a function of uh, the two Mandelstam invariants. <clears throat> the first viewpoint that you may want to take on this integral is, you can ask which kind of states are exchanged in this uh, four-point scattering process. Uh, let me start by telling this, this story in a math way. Suppose the challenge is to evaluate this uh, integral here. Well, in the best case scenario, you would just find a primitive and evaluate it at its boundaries. But finding a primitive is hard in this presentation. And one of the obstacles is that you have these different factors of Z2 and 1 minus Z2. And wouldn't life be easier if the second one was absent? Out of this wishful thinking, let's do a binomial expansion of the second factor, which decomposes the hard integral into infinite series of more elementary integrals. Of course, it remains to check whether um, one can commute integration with this infinite sum. But let's assume it does, and now we have an infinite series of elementary integrals. Let's pull out the infinite sum of the integral. So we get some binomial coefficients, which are degree n polynomials in S23. And now, for each term in this sum, the integral over Z2 is straightforward. Namely, you just pull down the overall exponent plus 1. OK. This is what you get from that binomial expansion in the integrand. And uh, some of the leading order terms look as follows.
Okay, let me no draw diagrams for these terms. Oh, yes, yes, thank you. Whoops. <clears throat> so each of these denominators we can interpret as propagators, and the mass of the particle can be directly read off. So from the first term here, we can infer this is a massless propagator. So the first term signals exchange of massless states. This is essentially following Feynman rules of young mills field theory. And all the remaining terms all the remaining terms in turn correspond to massive propagators. So this is an infinity of exchange diagrams where the external states are massless, but the internal states are massive. Let me draw a double line to distinguish massive propagators from massless propagators. Mm. Okay, and um, the masses signaled by all of these um, massive propagators, uh, the mass squares are integer divided by alpha prime. Okay, and now this is the point where uh, the signature of the metric uh, should appear. So the poles of the amplitude are located at a situation where this one is uh, minus n. Okay, so we have an equation k square equal minus m square. Is this the mostly plus or the mostly minus metric? Okay, mostly minus. I cannot. Ah, yeah, right, right. Okay, <laughs> thank you. Here we are. <clears throat> okay, yeah. So from the denominators here, you can infer that this string theory must have massive states in the spectrum. Suppose you are just given the amplitude dropping down from the sky, then uh, doing this expansion allows you to re reverse engineer what is the spectrum. You will get out that the mass squares are just uh, scaling like this with integers n. And there's a little bit more, what you can pull out of that amplitude. Let us uh, take a look at the numerators here. The numerators, which are polynomials in S23, they take the role of the interaction vertices here. So the residues of the respective poles, that tell you what's contained in the vertices. You can't resolve a single vertex, but you can resolve what's the product of uh, these vertices. So what you can, uh, see from these higher and higher polynomials in uh, momenta, you can see that there are higher derivative interactions at work. And uh, furthermore, the momenta you contract are on opposite sides of the propagator. So S23 means it's a momentum from here that you contract with a momentum there. How can you contract the two momenta on different sides? There must be some uh, chronicles in here. And there must be plenty of chronicles in here if you want to have a higher order polynomial. So you can infer that there must be higher spin at work. You can at least infer that at this order, for instance, there must be at least uh, two chronicles in that uh, propagator here. So you can at least get some bounds on what kind of spins must be involved. And uh, the higher you go in 4.5 point, 6 point amplitudes with massless states, the more details you learn about the higher spin states that are propagating in the internal propagators. So here at four points, it's relatively modest information content. It's just to notice that there are higher spins. All right, so this concludes the um, state exchange uh, viewpoint on this integral. Let me offer a completely orthogonal perspective. 
instead of a pop expansion, we could do the Taylor expansion in Alpha Prime that has been advertised before. So this is what I would call the effective field theory viewpoint. Whoops. So here, this is about the question, how can we alpha prime expand that expression, or how can we do a simultaneous uh, expansion in both S12 and S23? And this might be on the borderline of cheating. One way to get this alpha prime expansion is to notice that the integral is an Euler beta function. So step one is to look up in your favorite textbook that this is an Euler beta function. And step two is to have the Taylor series of these gamma functions at hand. Uh, more precisely, there's a nice formula for log of gamma 1 plus x, and it involves, among other things, uh, zeta values. Let me just write out the leading orders. That's enough to convey the physics message. By using some properties of the gamma function, you can infer that the leading orders in the alpha prime expansion look like this, where we have some examples of Riemann zeta, zeta n being defined as this infinite sum. And for the four-point purpose, it's enough to have the Riemann zeta function in your toolbox. But starting from the five-point function on, you also need so-called multiple zeta values, which are some sort of multi-argument generalizations of Riemann zeta. OK, and uh, again, let me draw diagrams for each term. So um, <clears throat> for the first term, it's quite boring. I can once again draw a Young-Mills Feynman diagram. But for the higher order terms, notice that only the first term has a pole. So only the first term has a signal of a propagator. All the others look local. So it seems like um, they are all signaling some four-point contact interactions. And now it's a matter of derivative counting to infer what kind of vertex is that. Admittedly, you would need to look back at the formula up there. You need to be quite careful in counting the exact number of derivatives. But what you will find, along with zeta 2, this is a total of eight derivatives. A total of four derivatives at that order. So you can infer this must be some trace of f to the fourth operator from the gauge theory point of view. Yeah, what do I mean by a uh, gauge theory point of view? Um, in the moment that we decide to tailor expand around alpha prime equals zero, we neglect the effect of the massive states. Okay, not really neglect, but we pretend that we have integrated out all the massive states. We don't look for poles and zeros anymore. We just look at the small neighborhood of the origin in alpha prime. So this operator comes from integrating out this infinite tower of massive states. Since, in, since it's infinitely many, it's quite natural that a Riemann zeta appears, which is an infinite sum. Some converse, uh, conservation of infinity. <laughs> yes, please. Oh, right. Um, this function here is almost symmetric under exchange of S and T. So up to some uh, elementary... Um, S over T or something, let's say it's symmetric. And I could have done this pole expansion in the completely opposite way. Do a change of variables, Z going to 1 minus Z, and exchange the role of S and T. So then you do the U-channel uh, expansion. And that's a really interesting feature, this kind of crossing symmetry. You can choose in which channel you manifest the poles. 
You can't manifest them at the same time, but amazingly, even though we just expanded in the S channel, you can be sure that the same poles will be present in the U channel. And these poles in the U channel, uh, sorry, in the T channel, you notice if you carefully track the polynomial dependence of uh, S to 3. Okay, it's not at all manifest, but... Oh... Oh yeah, right, the Young-Mills has the S-channel and T-channel. Then there's an inverse propagator for the S-channel. So it's, it's not completely honest. I mean, you really need to res resolve the details of that prefactor here. So please uh, view these statements, of, uh, these statements as being rather schematical. Yes, it is in the tree, uh, in the gauge theory tree amplitude. And if I want to get it from the integral, I need to look at a different integrand. I need a 1 minus C2 at that stage, if you want to get the t-channel pole from the integral. There are integration by parts relations that allow you to put the poles wherever you like them. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay, the only polarizations you see in that line are all contained here, but the converse is not true. Momenta occur both here and there. Yeah, so roughly speaking, think of this as being schematically some numerator on top of this pole plus some other numerator on top of that pole, where the stars are polarization vectors, momenta, and so on. Yeah. Okay, you, you, noticed, you noticed this guy? <laughs> Sorry, this is the drawback of uh, the way I presented that formula. <clears throat> okay, uh, let's do the analogous exercise for the zeta 3 term. As you see, there are two further, uh, two further derivatives as compared to the zeta 2. Um, so here it's an effective four-point vertex of type d square, f to the fourth. I mean, everything I'm writing down here must be gauge covariant. So I first do derivative counting, and I then match it with f's and covariant derivatives acting on that f. Right. Oh, yeah, that's a very difficult thing. Yeah, right. But uh, since I'm just doing four points here, I have no chance of seeing f to the 6. I need to compute the 5 and 6-point functions, so I just need to ask you for a few hours of patience. Right, but you can switch back and forth between d square f to the 4th and f to the 5th. Yeah. All right. Uh, yeah, so this finishes the appetizer example. A very simple but still non-trivial string amplitude and two sorts of physics that you can pull out of uh, investigating it. Okay, first of all, uh, we do a derivative counting. Um, you have four more derivatives as compared to the field theory limit. The field theory limit has, among other things, an a to the fourth vertex from the nonlinear field strength f mu nu, f mu nu, it, comes, it has, among other things, a to the fourth. How can you do four more derivatives than a to the fourth? The most democratic way of doing so is to put one derivative to each of the a's, and then you gauge covariantize it. Right, right. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. One of the other orderings has poles in the T channel and U channel. And accordingly, you can repeat that binomial expansion in two different ways in that other ordering. 
One will manifest the poles in the T-channel, the other one will manifest the poles in the U-channel. Yeah. Okay, so uh, let me now come to the last part of the intro session. The outline, what uh, comes next? Um, I admit this was so far very sketchy and just giving you some uh, schematic overview. What I will do next is an en detail discussion of the tree level amplitude prescriptions. in RNS and Pure Spinner. So this is maybe the most pedagogical side of the lecture. And once we have uh, pinpointed the opening line of these amplitude calculations, I'll uh, move on and report some results what kind of explicit expressions and what kind of beautiful structures have been squeezed out of these opening lines. So in slightly less detail, I will report on some research results. <clears throat> and this is now a rather idealistic collection of things that I dream of discussing. I can't promise that I'll get to all of them, but uh, at least these were my thoughts when uh, getting the invitation to lecture here. <laughs> so I'll for sure get to the point of telling you about the endpoint tree-level amplitude, something that, among other things, encodes the f to the 6 interaction that Igor would like to see. Um, there's a quite a beautiful structure to the endpoint result related to super young Mills trees. So there is, loosely speaking, a lot of field theory structure sitting in open string tree-level amplitudes. And uh, first of all, field theory will take care of all the polarization dependence, but even the alpha prime dependent part, even the endpoint generalization of this four-point integral will share a lot of relations and symmetries with field theory. Okay, so this is an excursion into the integrand world. Then we do some integrals. Uh, I will tell you more about the multiple zeta values that appear in the moduli space integrals at tree level. I will also point out an interesting relation between open and closed strings. Maybe, maybe somebody is thinking of Kawai level and Tai. Yes, this will also be reviewed. But most of all, I will give you a shortcut way to infer which multiple zeta values make it a closed string. This has to do with single valued polylogarithms. So that's a new viewpoint on how closed strings relate to open strings. Good, then we, we will hopefully get to one loop. I'll start with some structural comments on uh, how one loop amplitudes look, look like, tell you a bit about the kind of elliptic functions of the punctures that you can expect to see. Then I'll show you how to extract the box graph, this Feynman integral from the alpha prime to zero limit of one loop string amplitudes. Uh, this will be a way to prove the no-triangle property of maximally supersymmetric young mills and uh, n equal 8 supergravity. <laughs> and if time allows, I'll also give an orthogonal perspective on these field theory limits by sketching some properties of ambitwist of string theories. So these are very interesting string theories which only have a massless spectrum and which directly compute field theory integrands from worldship methods similar to the RNS and pure spinner superstring. Good. Uh, having done some field theory limits at one loop, I'll talk a bit about the uh, modular space integrals. So here there is some uh, upgrade of multiple zeta values, something that mathematicians call elliptic multiple zeta values, which you get from the open string alpha prime expansion at a fixed cylinder height. And uh, related to this, the analogous closed string alpha prime expansions on a fixed torus will give you modular forms, which again exhibit an intriguing relation to the open string um, 
data, the elliptic multiple zeta values. And at the end of the day, I hope to tell you something about the research frontier at the multi-loop level, where uh, two- and three-loop calculations have been performed with a pure spinner formalism, at least at the level of the low energy limit, where certain predictions of type 2b S duality have been uh, confirmed by most notably Humberto Gomez and Carlos Mafra. Yeah, as you see, this is a long list of things that could be discussed in the lecture. And in the process of deciding, I wanted to ask for your uh, opinion. Which kind of presentation mode would you prefer? On the one extreme, there is an en detail discussion of few things. So one extreme is to only go halfway through the list and discuss the topics of your choice with a lot of intermediate steps. And the other extreme would be that I go rather speedy and sketchy and make sure that I give you a little appetizer on more things on that list. So if you were to decide extreme A or extreme B, who would prefer few topics in great detail? I count 14. And who would prefer many topics, some of which at the superficial level? Ah, that's an easier count. <laughs> One, two. <laughs> okay. Okay, thank you. This is, this is very useful feedback. This will help me fine tune the, the later lectures for this week. Yeah, um, now that the intro is done, we can start with the RNS formalism. Shall we make a three-minute or five-minute break before doing so? Okay, let's reconvene in five minutes. Okay, thanks for coming back. After the overview part, and I want to go in detail through the RNS formalism and get you to the prescription to tree-level amplitudes. And uh, even though you asked me to be rather elaborate on few topics, uh, there are a lot of aspects of RNS which I'll do horrible injustice to, starting from spin fields or the subtleties with the beta-gamma system. There won't be any ADAS and XIs floating around. I will instead choose a path of presentation which takes you to the tree amplitude prescription in a somewhat efficient way. It's about backing up. Huh? Light no light cones, no light cones. Everything is going to be SO10 covariant. <laughs> but uh, yeah, this is just an important disclaimer ahead if there are many things that you would expect me to say and which, to your disappointment, I won't be saying. <laughs> okay. Yeah, and uh, also the goal would be to back up this four-point example that we looked at in some detail to convince you that at least for some tensor structure there is a four-point tree factoring out, a four-point gauge theory factoring out from the open superstring. It's just to get to the point of where we could reproduce that example from before with pen and paper effort. All right, in order to compute amplitudes, we need a weight action. So that's my starting point for this uh, chapter here. Uh, so this is about uh, defining to some extent what is meant by that uh, bracket from the general formula before, at least for low genera. So you're in evaluating these CFT correlation functions, you're in the end doing a path integral involving the following world sheet action for weighting. So I will spell out the meta part of the RNS world sheet action and I'll already go to a convenient gauge, essentially conformal gauge plus world sheet supersymmetrization. So for an open or closed string world sheet uh, capital sigma, the world sheet action to be used in the path integral is uh, essentially dx dx. So 
So here I'm again using complex coordinates for the, the world sheet as a convenient parametrization. Then there are various uh, shorthands around here. So this uh, del without any subscript refers to the holomorphic derivative. This one accordingly refers to the anti-holomorphic derivative. And then uh, vector indices of the Lorentz group will be denoted by letters M and P running from zero all the way to the space-time dimensionality minus one. <clears throat> okay, so this uh, clarifies what the first line means. And then, uh, well, as I said before, RNS does uh, supersymmetry on the world sheet. So now, there are some terms which contain fermionic superpartners on the world sheet to uh, these uh, X's up there. Oh yeah, I forgot to say, these X's are th need to be thought of as the embedding coordinates of the string. So Z uh, describing the world sheet directions of the string, proper time and the position on the string, and how all of this embeds into d-dimensional space-time. And now, uh, this psi field uh, does not have a direct interpretation of that type, but it's related to the X field by a world sheet supersymmetry transformation. Okay, so there are these uh, two types of matter fields. And uh, conceptually, what these um, Lorentz indices do here, you might think of them as labeling a vector. But this is the space-time point of view. If we are evaluating correlation functions, we are doing quantum field theory on the world sheet, two-dimensional QFT, more precisely, conformal field theory. So from the point of view of the world sheet, these vector indices are just spectators. So here, M just labels different scalars on the world sheet. So the field X is a scalar on the world sheet. And uh, these psi's down here, so there are two of them, psi and psi bar. So this doublet, in turn, forms a spinner on the world sheet. And again, they have space-time vector indices. So it's a total of uh, capital D such world sheet spinners in that action. Yeah, so don't worry ab about space-time indices. They are just spectators for the world sheet dynamics. And uh, on top of these uh, meta fields, there are also some super ghosts, which according to my earlier disclaimer, won't be spelled out. <coughs> but um, a important remark I need to make about them. So the suppressed ghosts here are referred to as the BC and the beta gamma system. They don't have any vector indices. And uh, yeah, so these ghosts and super ghosts, they're quite important if you uh, wonder about how the conformal symmetry carries over to the quantum level. If that theory is classically conformal, uh, is it clear that the quantum corrections will preserve that? So in order to check this, you're supposed to evaluate the central charge, the self-OPE of the energy momentum tensor. And uh, if you compute that central charge of these meta fields and the super ghosts, then you find in order to cancel conformal anomalies, you need to be in 10 space-time dimensions. So even though I was quite liberal for the range of M, N, and P, if you want to be critical, if you want to have no central charge, better make this choice. Of course, you can still open up new CFT sectors and still get to lower space-time dimensions. You can still reshuffle the central charge in a way that your space-time becomes lower dimensional. But if you're not creative with compactifications, better keep D equal 10. Okay, now let me talk about the bars in the formula above. Okay, in the first line, there's holomorphic and anti-holomorphic derivative. And in the second line, there are two species of these psi fields. In most of these lectures, I will focus the calculational work for the open string and get the closed string via recycling. So for most of the time, I won't be discussing the psi bars. And by some tricks that you'll see shortly, also the anti-holomorphic derivative of x can be mostly forgotten about if you're doing open string calculations. The reason is, if you do open strings, then there will be some boundary conditions, Dirichlet or Neumann, for the open string endpoints. 
And these boundary conditions will always interlock the holomorphic with the anti-holomorphic derivative, and likewise, the first spinner component psi with the second spinner component psi bar. So there's only one independent chiral half. That's why, from the next blackboard on, you will only uh, see, um, or mostly see, the two of them only. They're completely sufficient for open string purposes. And when we later come to the closed string, I will explain how to square the open string results in an appropriate manner to get all the closed string integrands. Okay, now the next thing uh, about the swirl sheet spinners. Uh, as usual, spinners are only defined up to a minus sign, so you can uh, sneak in minus signs when walking around periodic directions and so on. So this is known as uh, the so-called neve schwartz aramon sector of this psi system, and this in turn is related to the space-time statistics. But in this RNS part, I'll only talk about external bosons. I will neglect all the fermions because later with pure spinners, we have an easier time doing the fermions. So if you want to learn about the subtleties of space-time fermions in the Ramon sector, just approach me. I'm happy to chat with you about spin fields, but I didn't plan to dedicate uh, lecture time on this. So without loss of generality, we stay in the neve schwartz sector for the external states. And once we are in the loop level sector, I'll tell you about how to deal with Ramon states running in the loop. So for these reasons, you won't see much reference to neve schwartz aramon sector specifically. Though, of course, everything is in the RNS formalism that I'll say on the next blackboards. Okay, so the opening line towards correlation functions is an action. And let me now tell you how to use that action to actually determine correlation functions. And let's be modest here. Let's stick to the uh, tree level. <clears throat> okay, so if we are on the quest for correlation functions, let's uh, start with the simplest ones. Let's start with the two-point functions. And uh, according to the general idea of path integrals, the two-point function you get by inverting the kinetic operators in the action. So the, by kinetic operator, I mean uh, look in the action, where does a field appear quadratically? For the X field, it appears quadratically in the first line, and the kinetic operator is 1 over alpha prime del del bar. Okay, I admit I have mentally integrated one of the derivatives by parts, so boundary terms have been thrown away here. So for the two-point function of the boson, I have to invert this, and for the two-point function of the psi without the bar, I need to invert the del bar operator. Okay, and these inverses give rise to the two-point functions. Okay, in using the word invert, it sounds a bit as if I had matrices involved. Of course, these are uh, differential operators acting on an infinite-dimensional um, infinite space of functions. So here, inverse means look for the Green's function of the relevant differential operator. So this is essentially the two-dimensional Laplacian. And in two dimensions, the Green's function for the Laplacian is the log. And uh, this is a ubiquitous shorthand that I keep on using. Whenever you see a Z with two subscripts, it represents a difference of two punctures. Oh, yeah, uh, it should be a symmetric function by Bose's statistics, right? Yes, but uh, it should be when you consider the mood, uh, the holomorphic and the anti-holomorphic, not only the holomorphic. Mm -hmm. So I think for the, for the closed string, uh, this is how it should be on the nose. And for the open string, you get the two-point function by doing certain involutions. Or maybe you made a different point. Uh, yes. Yeah. It's true that you get the modulus z1 and 2 square because we have a holomorphic and a But uh, yeah, yeah. just for the holomorphic part, uh -huh. to be sure that 
Um, I think it is important to do this because when you compare open string amplitudes in different color orderings, it's really important to carry around these, these modulus uh, things. That's important for the monodromies. The open string correlators won't be quite holomorphic, but there's a minor departure from holomorphicity, which is exactly given by that modulus. Please ask me again when we come to the monodromy relations. I think they are needed. Well, your, your answers are really kind of themes. Mm -hmm. You're not uh, like uh, using XML theme, not XML theme. Right. Now, strictly speaking, at this point, it's not chiral, but as soon as you start taking derivatives in Z or Z bar, then you turn it into a chiral statement. Mm -hmm. But the second two-point function that I'm writing down is uh, honestly chiral. So here, this is um, the inverse of the del bar operator. That's always a little bit anti-intuitive. You invert an operator with a bar. Oh, okay. Okay, maybe we should discuss this in detail in one of the coffee breaks. I always thought that uh, also the Taurus wants that modulus, but uh, maybe there's... Uh, a space-time Taurus. Oh, okay. Okay. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, here for the two-point function of the uh, size without the bar, yeah, it's a holomorphic or meromorphic one over z, and this is the inverse to the to the del bar differential operator. <clears throat> Good. So this uh, determines the two-point functions, but on the long run, we want to do n-point amplitudes and need n-point correlation functions. How do we upgrade these two-point functions? Well, here we can take advantage of the fact that the action is quadratic in the fields. So the kinetic operators are basically all there is. So the path integral is uh, Gaussian, and therefore we can upgrade the two-point function to higher points by using the Wick rules. Um, let me give examples of how these uh, Wick rules uh, work. They essentially induce recursions at all the higher point uh, correlation functions. Uh, yes, please. Yeah. I could, if I insist, absorb an alpha prime into the psi. I never thought about the economic benefits of doing that. Maybe there is some virtue to it. Yeah. Maybe it's uh, just a weird choice or those nostalgic, nostalgic reasons. We could also set alpha prime to a half. <laughs> yeah. Um, no, there's no deep uh, thought about it. Uh. Okay, so let me start by giving you an example for this um, Wick rule and its induced recursion for psi. If you want to do a multipoint correlation function, let's be ambitious. Let's put uh, R of them. Then um, you can attack this by singling out your favorite field, say the first one, and you could look at its two-point contractions with all the other fields. So the two-point function of psi 1 with any other psi will give you one of these chronicles and a denominator of this type. And now it's important that these fields have Fermi statistics. No matter whether they are fermions in uh, space-time or on the world sheet, you pick up minus signs if you pull the psi's past each other. So if you want to look at a contraction psi 1 with psi 3, then you first have to jump over the psi 2. That's why there's an alternating uh, sign in what I'm doing here. Okay, uh, so here you see a two-point function, psi 1 and some other psi. And all the other fields are unaffected by this two-point contraction. So the companion of this term is an n minus two-point function. Ah, sorry, n is equal r here. This is an n minus two-point function with an omission of 
the jth psi. Okay, so this is honestly a recursion. The right-hand side has lower multiplicity than the left-hand side. You can keep on doing this until you chopped the endpoint function into products of two-point functions. And of course, these things are going to give zero if uh, n is odd. All right, so this is a application of the Vic rules. Let me show you another application. What if you have an exponential in the fields? which we will definitely need for the field X. So here, uh, there's an effect that the bracket essentially exponentiates. Uh, this is an informal way to describe the following calculation. Suppose you are looking at exponentials of the field X. And admittedly, this is still a non-chiral statement since I have not yet taken holomorphic derivatives. Okay, so the path integral means integrate over all the modes of x, and there is first of all a zero mode for the center of mass coordinate. The zero mode will tell us that the momentum here needs to be conserved. a momentum-conserving delta function from the zero modes of x. And then, from the non-zero modes, we get an exponential of, and this is something quite amusing, we get exponentials of two-point functions. Okay, how does this work? Just do mentally the following exercise. Expand all the exponentials. So then you have a product of many expanded exponentials. And then you look at the combinatorial game. How can I do Wick contractions over the many, many terms from this expansion? And then you can organize the possible Wick contractions according to how many times does the field I Wick contract with field number J. So by using this combinatorial uh, game in your head, you can convince yourself that this correlation function can walk over to the exponent. But now we are in a quite uh, fortunate situation. The two-point function is a log, and the log is sitting in the exponent. That's uh, going to have a much easier representation. Namely, what you get is, apart from the delta function, you just get this absolute value to the power Sij. Okay? By just inserting the log from, from up there. And uh, just remember, we are having these dimensionless Mandelstam invariants. Okay, and uh, since this guy will appear so many times, let me give it a name. I will have to write this guy forever and ever. So therefore, let me introduce a shorthand, IN. That's the shorthand for this guy. And uh, it's referred to as the so-called Coba-Nielsen factor. And now I have made tacitly one small assumption. I'm again stuck in the massless world here. So I have assumed that all the masses squares are zero. I mean, if you're really careful, the two-point function in the exponent gives you a chronica, contracting the momenta. So strictly speaking, you have the dot products in here. And maybe you're used to the slightly different definition of the Mandelstams as alpha prime times ki plus kj square. So just to be clear about this part. At the massless level, 
it doesn't really matter whether you do the dot product or whether you have ki plus kj squared. Okay, and another comment concerning the delta function. As you see, I already got lazy in not spelling out its argument, and uh, I will no longer track whether there's a momentum conserving delta function or not, because in each amplitude of interest, there is such a momentum conserving delta function from the correlator here. Momentum conservation is implicit from now on. Okay, so this is another application of the Wick theorem. Let me give a last example where some of the previous ideas are combined. So this exponential correlator is already a preview of what kind of stuff you will find in the vertex operators. But strictly speaking, the massless vertex operators of the superstring will even challenge you to deal with the axis in the correlation function along with many exponentials. Also, this correlation function will be on the to-do list. <clears throat> By the way, um, I think strictly speaking, I would need to put some normal ordering colons here. Maybe this would already be necessary for the exponentials here by saying that you don't Vic contract fields that are on the same space-time point. Whenever something would blow up, you just don't do it. It's the informal way of saying this. So here's the disclaimer that normal ordering is implicit. So there is an exponential at z1, but there's also a dx at z1. You might shout that, hey, this is giving you infinity. But there's always the normal ordering disclaimer that you don't do the contractions that blow up. Oh, yeah, right, right. <laughs> it's true. <clears throat> okay, so there are even more big contractions than up here, but a large set of them will conspire to give you the same Koba Nielsen factor as before. Putting it differently, you can always factor out the Koba Nielsen factor. And then, after factoring out Koba Nielsen, you look at the leftover contractions, how the, these guys can play out. So, with this, we have contracted the exponentials among themselves, and now we have the simpler task of contracting the dx's. And the first way how this can be done is giving you a chronicler. Uh, well, then I think, yeah. Uh, they are not. I mean, they're. Uh, yeah. So I think uh, this, this sounds like related to the norm normal ordering issue, and it's the next term which will reflect my disclaimer. So now I'm looking at all possibilities to contract the d axis against the exponentials. That's coming now. So let's take the d x at position one. Whenever you are contracted against an exponential, you will pick up a simple pole, like the first derivative of the log. And then the residue of that pole is the corresponding space-time momentum. And due to the normal ordering, I won't go to the value 1, where the simple pole here blows up. And the very same applies to the dx at position z2. So here it's a summation variable j. So this is about a contraction of z2. Oh, I'm sorry. This is an i here. z2 against the location in the exponential, and the singular part with j equal 2 is excluded. Oops. <clears throat> OK.
Yeah, so this is, uh, I hope, a representative example how you deal with uh, the axis outside the exponent. I guess you can imagine how the story goes on if you have more than two. <clears throat> and uh, having given some basics on correlation functions, let me now introduce the vertex operators for the massless states, or just for the space-time uh, bosons. Uh, okay, first of all, some general comments about uh, the spectrum or what a vertex operator is. The general rule is each open string state is or corresponds to a conformally invariant deformation of the action. So strictly speaking, it's a super conformally deformation of the action. Let's uh, make a schematic ansatz. And now, since we are talking about open string states, as I told you before, open string states are inserted on the boundary of the world sheet. So now, on top of the action that is a two-dimensional integral, we add a one-dimensional line integral over the boundary. These are the admissible insertion points for open string vertex operators. And here you see a loose description of the state operator correspondence for each state phi. There is a field on the world sheet boundary, a so-called vertex operator. that is supposed to give you a super conformally um, invariant deformation of the action. There's a word missing. Super conformally invariant deformation of the action. Okay, I didn't say much about super conformal field theory, but uh, in order to be super conformally invariant, it should at the very least be conformally invariant. So at the very least, such a vertex operator must be a conformal primary of uh, weight. So this is the necessary condition. This is the non-super part of being super conformally invariant. But uh, what is the effect of the super? What does a super conformal primary have? on top of the properties of a normal primary. So if you look at the literature on superconformal uh, algebras, you will find that superconformal primaries are in fact doublets. They are always combinations of two states that are referred to as a superconformal primary. And uh, the two members of the doublet are related by the supercurrent. One is the G minus a half action on the other. Okay, so this is to anticipate for a given state, there's actually more than one, one, one vertex operator if we are doing superconformal field theory. Okay, so on the one hand, I'm telling you about uh, primaries of conformal weight one. On the other hand, I'm telling you about doublets with a weight-shifting supercurrent insertion. So you might be worried that the conformal weight of the supercurrent conflicts with the earlier condition. Yeah, so the two members of the doublet don't have the same conformal weight, H. And in order to balance that, there's a neat construction using the ghost sector. Namely, there's a ghost field that saves the day. It's not directly the beta or gamma ghost, but it is sometimes uh, referred to as the delta function of the gamma ghost. Quite a weird object. Delta function of a bosonic uh, ghost. Now, I won't use the gamma description. Let me just say, um, here is an object that saves the day. 
it's a ghost field which has the right conformal weight to resolve that uh, conundrum here. So this has an additional conformal weight a half, and in order to give this the same conformal weight as that, I'm sneaking in a ghost here. You will see it on the next blackboard what it means. But let me just uh, write down the correlation function that we need for this ghost field. I want to make sure that you have seen all the OPEs. So if it's a conformal weight a half field, then its two-point function has no other choice than being this one. <clears throat> but okay, let me now elaborate on how to um, write down a superconformal primary of vertex operators. Um, the non-intuitive thing that happens here is we will get more than one representative per state. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, um, how did this go? Is it easy to see? Okay, I guess you need a definition of the primary. It's annihilated by certain uh, non-negative modes of the energy momentum tensor and the supercurrent. And I think this definition leads you to, to, to this, but I would have to look it up and remind myself of the details. I think it is easy, but it's due to the ignorance of the speaker that there's no lightning answer. Yeah, what I was about to say, um, yeah, since we are dealing with a doublet of uh, vertex operators, there is more than one representative per uh, physical state. And uh, let me now be fully explicit. Here is a representative for a gluon vertex operator. In order to uh, form a conformal primary of weight one, I can uh, start with uh, one of these psi fields, this uh, world sheet spinner. But by itself, it only has conformal weight um, a half. But I was just telling you that if you are lacking a bit of conformal weight, you can borrow it from the ghost sector. So here, for one of the choices, for one representative of the vertex operators, you just put in the h equal a half ghost field. And now, at this point, you can view this as an ansatz. It is the psi field contracted into something. So at the moment, this vector epsilon is just a dummy, and it will be constrained later on. So this is an ansatz to form a conformal primary of weight one. But now, I was telling you about the story with the doublet. In order to get a superconformal primary, I must also look at the g minus a half image of what I started with. So if you use the supercurrent related to the uh, descending from the world sheet action, you will find another flavor of vertex operator. So this time it has two terms. The first one is the dx, which you already saw in action for correlation functions. And then there's a second term. Which reinforces a question from before, why I didn't absorb alpha prime into psi bilinears. So you can convince yourself, when forgetting about the ghost, applying the supercurrent to this one lands you here. And as I said, the ghost was just some sort of auxiliary construction to balance the conformal weights, so I don't stick any ghosts here. Okay, and um, now both of these um, fields should be honest conformal primaries. And by counting the conformal weight of the individual fields, you can verify that you're on a right track. However, we need to be careful about this uh, vector epsilon here. This one can screw up the conformal weight if we are not careful. So there's a 
extra constraint on the vector if we want to be a conformal primary. Namely, that vector should better be perpendicular to the momentum, which is upstairs in the exponent. Okay, uh, I need to give you the supercurrent to help you um, check that for yourself, but just believe me, if you don't impose this, then there is a defect to the conformal primary condition. But now, this condition here, k dot epsilon equals zero, this is a nice thing. This actually signals that we are on the right track to studying a gauge boson from quantum field theory, from perturbative gauge theory. You know that. This is just the condition on your uh, linearized solutions to the field equations. So this is a usual condition for gauge theory polarizations. But now that I'm telling you good news about connections with gauge theory, I should verify one important uh, property of gauge bosons. There should be a gauge symmetry associated to it. And uh, as I was just uh, saying, the idea is that this corresponds to a linearized solution to the gauge theory equations of motion. So for the gauge symmetry, I should study the linearized regime. I should check whether these vertex operators are invariant under linearized uh, gauge transformations. Of course, in a non-abelian gauge theory, you all know that the full gauge symmetry is nonlinear, that the field transforms by a gradient plus a commutator. But at the linearized level, forget about the commutator. It's just a gradient. And uh, in momentum space, Adding a gradient means you shift the polarization vector by a momentum. So all this to say, the next job for us is to check whether these vertex operators are preserved under such a linearized gauge transformation. Okay, so let's uh, check how this works. And I'll only do the check for you in the zeroth ghost picture because it's harder to check this in the minus one picture. So I'm just giving you some preliminary evidence that this is okay. And here I'm connecting with the opening line of this section. I was telling you about vertex operators as a deformation of the action, so that's why I'm integrating V0 here before taking the gauge variation. But okay, time to get explicit. What happens with the above form of V0? How does it behave if I stick in epsilon equal K? So what you get is uh, I mean, epsilon is contracting a dx in the first term. So this is what you get from the first term. And then, for the fermion bilinear, there was already one momentum upstairs before gauge transformation, and now there is a second momentum descending from the uh, epsilon. So there's a symmetrized uh, bivector here, momentum, momentum. But what does it contract into? it contracts into a bispinner. So the bispinner is anti-symmetric MN, MN, the bivector is symmetric. So the second term is uh, clearly zero. Putting it differently, here you have the linearized field strength contracting the psi psi. Okay, so let's not worry about the second term, but uh, the first term on the other hand, this doesn't look particularly zero. However, it is a total derivative. Just check for yourself, taking the holomorphic derivative for an exponential gives you precisely that. So it's not vanishing, but it's pretty close to that. And let's see, is it sufficient if uh, the gauge transformation hands you a total derivative? Well, this vertex operator is supposed to be integrated over, if we are not in the SL2 fixed leg. So upon integration, you will see it integrated uh, along with the Koba-Nielsen factor from the correlator of the exponentials. But how does the Koba-Nielsen factor transform, or how does the Koba-Nielsen factor affect the boundary terms? So let me give you a sample calculation from that. I dare to call this uh, maybe the a fundamental lemma of uh, string amplitudes saying that total derivatives 
in Z decouple when you have a Cobain-Nielsen factor next to it. So just uh, imagine you have a total derivative with a Cobain-Nielsen factor in the integrand. And evaluating this total derivative as boundary terms means you are asked to place that puncture either on the location of the upper limit or on the lower limit. So these are the kind of boundary terms that you get. But what was the definition of the Cobain-Nielsen factor? It was loaded with all these differences raised to some power. So both of these uh, boundary terms on the right-hand side scale as follows. For both boundary terms, you can find a factor inside the Cobain-Nielsen factor that will uh, die off. Right? So here I've just replaced these concrete limits uh, on the right-hand side by some generic statement that A goes to ZB. No matter what A and B are, there's always a factor like this inside the Cobain-Nielsen factor. And the bold claim is... Absolutely. That's the next thing to say. So this statement uh, that it's equal to zero is, let me say, obvious if the real part of that kinematic variable is uh, larger than zero. Yeah, I guess that's a flashback to something in uh, uh, Ted's lecture. So either we are in a good kinematic regime where this is obvious, and uh, otherwise you can ensure that it's the case by analytic continuation. Okay. Yeah, sorry, this was a slightly tangential uh, discussion. Uh, the starting point was to convince you that there is uh, gauge freedom for these vertex operators, that a gauge transformation on the gluon does not change the vertex operator. And in order to convince you of that, I gave the above argument that this total derivative integrates to zero. Okay. Yeah. Um, this is probably a good uh, point to stop. Um, one can do an analogous discussion for space-time fermions, but for those, I would need to introduce a spin field, which is sometimes viewed as a rather subtle corner of the RNS formalism. I won't do that. So therefore, we are already done with the master's vertex operators. Thanks. All right, then. See you tomorrow. <laughs>